morning and good evening to everyone here. I am Leslie Ann Villanueva and one of the interns under Cities for CEDAW and a member of CEDAW Youth based in Manila, Philippines. I am an incoming fourth year international studies student studying in Miriam College, Philippines. Hi everyone, I'm Natalia, currently based in New York City. I'm an attorney, graduated from the University of Buenos Aires, and uh, currently I'm doing a course about children's rights by Harvard University. Um, and above all, I love being part of this exciting project about Cities for Sida. For today's session, our guest will be Krishanti Dharmaraj. She is the Executive Director at the Center for Women's Global Leadership. She is a feminist and a human rights activist with over 25 years of experience working to advance the rights of women and girls. She is the founder of the Dignity Index, a human rights measurement tool utilized to ensure equity and inclusion to reduce identity-based discrimination. Previously, Dar Mirage was the Western Regional Spokesperson for Amnesty International USA. She is also the co-founder of Wild for Human Rights and the Sri Lanka Children's Fund. Not only that, but Mrs. Darmarash serves on the steering committee for the Feminist Alliance for Rights and the board of directors of IDEX. Is a member of the Spotlight Civil Society Global Reference Group, a trustee of the International Roundtable for Sustainable Tea, and the Northeast Women's Network in Sri Lanka, and is on the advisory boards of Amnesty International, the Human Rights Rights Project of the Urban Justice Center, South Asia Democracy Watch, and MAGIC, an organization enhancing the well-being of those living in Tibet. She has also served on the board of directors of Amnesty International, Women Law and Development, Horizons Foundation, and the Center for Asian Pacific Women. Under her leadership, San Francisco became the first city in the U.S. to pass legislation implementing an international human rights treaty. As a result of passing CEDAW in San Francisco, the city implemented a gender analysis in departments that assessed employment, programming, and service delivery and resource allocation. Currently, this public policy strategy is being implemented in cities across the United States. She has received numerous awards for her cutting-edge work, conducted training, and lectured extensively in the U.S. and abroad. Ms. Dharmaraj is an MBA from the Haas School of Business, University of California at Berkeley. Without further ado, let us, give, let us all give Ms. Dharmaraj all our warmest greetings in our chat or reaction emojis. Hello, Mrs. Krishanti. Um, anything you want to add to your in introduction? Uh, no, it was uh, daunting and humbling to listen to it. <laughs> I'll try to live up <laughs> to the best of my ability. <laughs> That's great, Ms. Dharmaraj. Also, before I start, I would like to inform everyone that you are free to ask your own personal questions. Please don't hesitate to send it in our chat box. With that, let's start with our first question. How did you know about CEDO? Why did you decide to dedicate your time to it? And how did it pave way for you to become aware of CTs for CEDO? Um, thank you, thank you for the question. Thank you for the warm welcome and for spending this time uh, with us. And good morning and good evening to those of you who are in the West Coast, uh, East Coast. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the first question is about how did I get to know about CEDA, correct? And then what made me join Cities for CEDA? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I mean. I've known CEDA as long as I can remember human rights. Right? Um, so I started working uh, at Amnesty International when I was a student, when I was a college student. Um, and CEDA was very much a part of the conversation, right? Uh, however, uh, United States is the only industrialized nation not to ratify CEDA, right? 
So it was very important as a person who wanted to do human rights, right? And wanted to do human rights to advance women's rights in the US as well as outside my country that I understood it, right? So the first set of it was to understand what CEDA is, what it does for women. And it is, it, it is almost a way of life, right? It is a way of life for the world, right? And if we, just nothing else, if we as countries adopted CEDA, included it in our constitutions and implemented even 50%, I think the world would be a beautiful place, better than what it is now. So hence my commitment to CEDO and because US had not ratified CEDO very specifically in 1996, uh, it was a very great time in the US because we had just gone to the world conference uh, you know, on women in Beijing in 95. We came back, there was a lot of excitement in the country and an acceptance that women's rights are human rights. Um, and we really thought that the United States government will pass CEDAW. And in 1996, at a meeting in DC, Washington DC, I really felt that it was not going to happen. So I was living in San Francisco and I went back and I spoke to a couple of my friends slash colleagues uh, at Amnesty International, um, Women's Foundation of California. And we decided that we were going to really look at how to adopt CEDA at the local level. We really had no idea how it will go. Um, I mean, Cities for CEDA is an extraordinary uh, vision that Sun Yun really is in the forefront of bringing to all of us. Um, so she saw what San Francisco did and she wanted to make sure that, you know, um, that city, as many cities in the world would do this. And I cannot imagine not doing it, frankly. So, you know, from the time I've known Sun Yun and she has talked about cities for CEDO, I've been a part of it. How inspiring. And as related to the previous question, I saw that you are the executive director of the Center for Women's Global Leadership. Um, could you explain what you do in that role and its relation to CEDA on a broader level? Yes, very good question. Uh, the Center for Women's Global Leadership is 30 years old, right? It got started in 1991 before many of you were born. Um, really to uh, respond to the level of violence that women were facing. Because back in the day, uh, and to an extent now, you know, violence against women is considered like a private act, right? And therefore, it is like it takes, it doesn't take priority uh, when you think about public policy, investing in eradicating violence, right? and is not part of a national discourse in every, any country, right? When a country talks about peace and security, ending violence against women is not included, right? So our founder, Charlotte Bunch, along with a group of women um, who were gathered actually in our office in Rutgers University, New Jersey, uh, who used to come together for three weeks to talk about feminist leadership uh, and how to propel it globally, um, came up with the idea of the 16 days campaign to end gender-based violence. And I know you run it in your university. You, you run the campaign. So that was like the beginning of the Center for Women's Global Leadership's work. So up to now, we work around ending gender-based violence against women, right? And you know, we run the campaign, uh, um, the 16 days campaign from November 25th to December 10th. Along with that time, right? And if you really look at violence, violence is really an indicator of gender-based discrimination in it's one of its extreme forms, right? So if, you are to really eradicate violence, 
then you have to really address reducing and eliminating gender-based discrimination, right? So that is the inextricable link between CEDAW that really provides step-by-step -step guidance in how to reduce discrimination and achieve not formal equality, but substantive equality. That means equity and equality put together, right? Which is really important for women because formal equality is like sending all girls to school and all children to school, right? Substantive equality is about the result, right? How are those girls treated? Do they have programs and subjects that really change the way they will understand and learn? And then will they graduate? That is the result. Right, so CEDA allows for that, and that is the beauty of CEDA. Right, so if we can really achieve and implement CEDA, then the level of violence in the world can reduce. So that is the broader connection of the work that we do at the Center for Women's Global Leadership. So my specific job includes setting policy for the organization speaking, uh, engaging in global advocacy, developing strategy for national and regional work, right? And fundraising, that covers it. Indeed, uh, violence against women has been overlooked for such a long time. And I also appreciate how you emphasize how violence can exacerbate already existing inequalities that we experience. And since we are already talking about your experiences, I'm also curious about you being the co-founder of Wild for Human Rights. Could, could you tell us about your experience in that role and how did it shape your perspective of leadership and promotion of women's participation at the personal level? Thank you. Very, very thoughtful question. It brings my whole world kind of together. So I, as I said, I was working at Amnesty International uh, in the Western region in San Francisco. Um, and I went to Beijing, um, you know, uh, as part of my work, I was doing women's human rights work, I was preparing uh, Amnesty's work and portfolio and, and campaign work in preparation to go to Beijing, right? And Beijing was a watershed moment, it changed the lives of everyone who gathered there, and those who engaged in that process, right? Um, there were two things that happened. I noticed, and, and most of us who went from the US noticed that everyone else who came from other countries had a national agenda. They knew how to lobby their governments. They had very specific demands from their governments. Canada to you know, France, to Mexico, uh, Philippines, India, Sri Lanka, everyone, right? They had their agendas and they were advocating for uh, women's human rights for the Beijing Platform for Action and they were advocating for their national agendas. Based on my um, experience at the World Conference, US was the only disorganized country as a collective to go into China and then demand accountability from the Chinese government and talk about women's human rights with no national agenda. We actually going in were somewhat polarized, right? We had um, women of color were separated from European American women, indigenous women couldn't even make it. Uh, there were women who were Tibetan women who were living in the US who went, who had their own agenda. We looked very fragmented. And in Beijing, we had an opportunity, like right? Because Hillary Clinton there said women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights once and for all. But we as a country were not poised and strategically ready to bring that home collectively. Right? But we did a lot of work globally. 
I mean, there are women from pretty much in the New York area, very specifically push the envelope, including the Center for Women's Global Leadership for global rights, right? So I felt that it was a huge opportunity lost and that we did not have a human rights agenda within our own borders. And we could not hold our government accountable, the United States government accountable in that arena, right? So I came back, I quit my job at Amnesty, not always smart, but I did it and my boss was very nice and she supported uh, me starting Wild for Human Rights. And the aim of Wild for Human Rights was at that time was to engage women in the margins, women of color, uh, young women who were under the age of 18, some of them had not even finished school, right? Some of them had children. So immigrant, indigenous, and those who um, identified as women of color in the US to bring their lived experiences, right? Into the forefront of an agenda nationally. And we wanted to use human rights. So that is why it's called Women's Institute for Leadership Development for Human Rights. It was very hard. Um, because uh, most people, the leadership of the United States, uh, including at the State Department, uh, felt that it was not necessary to do human rights work within the US borders. Like it was more important for us to focus outside. No funder in the US in 1995 had a portfolio that focused on human rights within the US. So that means that we could not really get funding from a regular place doing human rights, regular foundation doing human rights work, right? So it was so it was um, two women. So two of us who came together. We are both immigrants to the U.S. She's um, uh, Weni Kusuma uh, was originally is originally from Indonesia, and she and I were doing. Um, I was on the board of La Casa de las Madres, which is a battered women's shelter in the uh, in. Uh, San Francisco, it is also the oldest shelter in California and one of the first in the United States. Um, and she was the executive director and we, we met and we, we both felt, you know, that this gap had to be addressed. And so our plan was that if there was going to be another conference, another world conference, that we would have a group of women who understood human rights, who could look at the relevance of human rights to their lives and their communities and will be able to articulate the struggle within the United States as a human rights struggle. So that's that's how Wild for Human Rights got started. And our first project was to pass CEDO in San Francisco. Thank you so much, Ms. Kishanti. And with all these experiences and knowledge that you are aware of now, um, what do you think are the necessary steps to promote SIDA in different levels? Um, I, would, I would like to say that it has to have a horizontal and a vertical approach, right? So that's a strategy, right? So uh, let's talk about the vertical strategy, right? That means that it, it has to be it has to be in everyone's home. It has to be a children's book, right? In a, it has to be a picture book, right? And it doesn't have to be where you talk about CEDA one article at a time, but you can have a story for every article, right? So I think that is where it has to start, right? Even before when, when uh, women read to their fetuses, that should be one of the books, right? And it has to be, so, so that is like at the very lowest core level at home, right? It has to be in any public space that is hospitals. So that means that it is okay for hospital staff to know about the human right to health. It has to be understood because other nurses in other countries know about CEDA. Others don't, right? So I think there's a way in which we can have, we can look at public health at large, right? It's very important to look at CEDA and integrate it to public health because CEDA sits in that framework of public health, 
right? It is important to look at the price. So when you look at a public spaces, I'm looking at health, I'm looking at education, law enforcement, very important, <laughs> right? Um, and then we had to look at the private sector. So we talk about women's equality at work, equal pay for equal work. Everyone talks about it, right? Especially with um, when we think about uh, COVID, we have talked a lot about unpaid care work, right? So we have to incorporate into labor. So you know, labor can be public and private and formal and informal, right? But if you take the private sector, when you're talking about equality at work and gender equality is a, is a buzzword these days in companies, everyone wants to, to, to do the right thing. CEDA has to be a part of that. CEDA has to be part of the human resource management space. And that's what actually what we did in, in San Francisco. So CEDA was uh, taken in, um, we trained, um, the unions, we trained the human department of human resources, right? And anyone who was supervising and bringing people into different departments in San Francisco, right? And then you look at your government agencies, right? And, and I'm kind of putting the government agencies higher because they are accountable to us, right? We, we, they are appointed because of our tax dollars and they need to be held accountable. That is a space for CEDAW, right? And finally, the national government and at the regional and international levels. So if you're looking at humanitarian spaces, CEDAW should be part of that space, right? Any war, right? Anytime we are talking about women's rights, CEDA has to be a part of it. So that would be like the vertical approach, right? And horizontally, it is about every place where humans inhabit, right? And that includes men and women, that includes both boys and girls, right? And it has to happen at every level. Wherever we inhabit, CEDO has a role in it. So that, that's my, my wish and, and my uh, kind of ideal dream. Thank you. These are such comprehensive and inclusive ideas. I am also hoping that this would be applied here in the Philippines. But we have to agree that not everything is always smooth sailing and there will be always bumpy roads along the campaign. Considering that, what are the challenges that you have experienced in the campaign? How did you overcome these challenges? So I will tell you a secret. So both our countries, Philippines and the United States, is going through a very difficult time. You have a new president, <laughs> okay? I won't go into detail, but we just walked out on abortion being a right and access to abortion, right? So we are taken like huge steps back. And, um, and if CEDAW was to be passed now or negotiated now, right? I think we would, I think people would dilute that language, right? When I say pe people in office, people in government, you know, uh, member states, right? We as activists have a choice. I'm not saying that problems should be ignored or we should gloss over, right? Or um, kind of pretend that they don't exist. Problems are very real. But if we engage only in reacting to problems, we would not know where we are going. That is the fundamental difference in activists and the religious right. Religious right and the conservative agenda is very clear where they are going, right? They know they don't want women's human rights, right? And they know what they want. They want to ensure that they are in control of women, right? And we are constantly reacting. So challenges I will talk about, I think it's really important for me to, before we end, for you to recognize that it is always important to have your purpose be positive, right? So if your purpose is very, very clear, it, it can be very simple, but very clear and not 
in the negative language, but in the positive. It's not ending discrimination, but achieving substantive equality or achieving rights, right? Then you are focused on that and not necessarily, right, in ho the horrible stuff that's happening to us that is exhausting to respond to. So, but if you do keep at what is important and your eyes on focus on that price that you want, the challenges that you face, you will react only in response to what you want not in response to what is happening at a big level. I don't know whether I'm making sense, okay? So for example, for CEDAW in San Francisco, it was a time in affirmative action in California, that's uh, article four, temporary special measures were completely destroyed. Like people voted not to have affirmative action so I, like a group of us were asked to speak on television about um, what CEDAW would, how CEDAW would be different and whether it'll break that law that just got passed. And so we came up with a uh, statement. We said, human rights is not about quotas. Right? It's not about numbers. It's about quality of life. That is our focus. If you want us to talk, that is what we are going to talk about, right? And we will engage in that sense how actually the law violates human rights, right? But we will not engage in telling whether we are going to um, you know, act against or violate that particular law because it doesn't apply to what we want to do and what we want for women in San Francisco. Right? So you will meet challenges, but I think once you know what you want, you would be able to meet those challenges slightly differently and with less stress. Stress will always be there, but it will be less. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, now let's get more specific to San Francisco. Um, seeing that it's the first city in the US to pass legislation implementing an international human rights treaty. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this from its formulation to its implementation maybe? So I don't, I want to do a time check, it's eight o'clock. Are you still okay going late? Yes, yes, we have 30 minutes more. So. Oh, okay, all right, okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm sorry, can you ask me the question again? Because I was distracted with time. No worries. Um, I was thinking if you could uh, tell us a little bit uh, more about uh, this connected with uh, that San Francisco is the first city in the US to pass legislation implementing an international human rights treaty. Um, mainly uh, from its formulation to its implementation, all that you want to add about this. Okay. Um, so I didn't, we didn't realize actually in San Francisco that when we passed CEDAW at the local level, it was the first time in the world, not just in the US that it happened. It's a good thing we didn't know that actually. It might have gone to our head or maybe we would have been too scared to do it, <laughs> right? So again, we actually, so we, we were, Wild for Human Rights was challenged by people, like, incredible, wonderful humans in the US said, why do you want to do this? We already have women's rights. There's a brilliant civil rights agenda. What will human rights add? They said, if you can prove it, we'll give you money. Like, you know, that was like a funders story, right? At the same time, even the women that we, I was working with women of color because US has done a painful job of separating civil and political rights from economic, social and cultural rights. And we prioritize civil and political rights. Um, and that is our domestic agenda. And we don't talk about human rights, right? Even for women, and. So even for women in the US who are working on gender-based violence, 
um, public health, sexual and reproductive rights, economic justice. To them, it was like, what is this going to do for us? Like, how will this change our world, right? So CEDAW was really a response to examining and providing evidence of the added value of human rights, right? At a very local level. And I'll, I'll speak a little more on that. And so, you know, we didn't know what the results are going to be, but we wanted to show that there's an added value to human rights. And if we use it, um, we would be better for using it as a framework, right? Than any other model that was there. So that was one. And the second, as I said, you know, our government was very clear that we, we were very clear. We, our government was not going to ratify CEDA. Like it was not going anywhere. And it was really painful, right? And we wanted to, and it's San Francisco and um, San Francisco was at a very good place at that time. Uh, and we felt like, you know, let's try this. Because nobody has done it. Nothing can go wrong, you know. Let's give it a shot. Whether we can not only talk about why human rights are important and its added value, but can we translate into public policy and implement it so we can actually change the way, you know, a city operates, right? So it was really in response to that challenge that we had to figure out how to show the meaning, you know, how human rights help. Now it's a conversation like in the Philippines you would not need to have because you have you inherently understand the role of human rights. We in the United States don't actually. The average very smart person does not think it applies, right? So the beginning step was we also, um, while for human rights, <clears throat> decided to do human rights trainings. Because we thought if we do human rights trainings and if people were, if, if, if women that we like we worked with <clears throat> really thought that it wasn't a good idea or it didn't make any sense, they were smart enough to tell us, right? So we started doing training. So we did a first training on human rights um, and we brought into that space women advocates, feminists who work on violence against women right, uh, economic justice and health. So these are three groups, you know, back in the day and still now don't talk to each other, right? We work on our own silos, right? And we told them that if they use human rights, it shows the interdependency of rights. That means that you can't end gender-based violence if the health agenda is not a good one, right? Like, because public health needs to be there, the health services have to be there. So you need to really work with those who are working on reproductive rights and health, right? And for those who are working on economic justice that they have to really recognize what it means to have health, right to health and safety at home, at work and in the world, right? You can't really do a job really well if you're really scared for your life, right? So we were able to frame this in human rights. So that was like day one. And day two, we went into CEDAW. And for each article, right, in, when you're doing it from a workshop standpoint, you can tell stories. Where have you seen a right violated? And where have you seen something go right, right? And something good that has happened, right? So, that is the way in which we introduce. But at the end of it, three things happen. One is that inherently it showed that women will be able to work together regardless of their subject area, right? Their silo, right? That it, it, it forced them to see the interdependency of their work, right? Second, it really showed that one identity cannot be prioritized over another. So it's not only about women of color, it's about queer women, right? It's not only about queer women, it's about poor white women, 
it's not only about poor white women. It's about indigenous. It's about disabled. It's about rich white women who also don't have access. If they went through a divorce, they would not have access to the money that their, their husband would have had, right? So in divorce, white women lose in that space. And we don't really talk about it, right? So CEDA allowed to show that regardless of our identity, we can transcend it and organize together, right? And that was a huge breakthrough, right? And the third was that our state, California, had already passed this anti-affirmative action law, right? We already had something called um, welfare reform, and so the social protection was being pulled back, right? Um, and we needed a new, new way to think of the work so that the government will not come after us. So that is how local implementation of CEDAW happened. So what we really did was to say that all the problems that women face in a city, right, can be first understood, right, and responded to if you understood CEDAW and if you understood it as a human rights violation or a human right. So that is the way in which we got started. Um, very basically, um, my, one of my, of my three strengths, one of them is strategy. Uh, so I'm, I'm good at it. Uh, and I've, I've been doing it for a while. Um, so I developed the strategy about how to continuously bring women on so we don't lose the momentum, right? So we had a task force, we had women making decisions, we were clear who was making decisions. We went to schools, we went to every organization, we had brown bag lunches to introduce what CEDAW is, because we knew not all women can come out of their offices, right? Not everyone has a lunch hour, right? So if, you're, if you want to talk to women janitors, you have to catch them at eight o'clock in the night. That is their break time before they finish at 11 o'clock, right? So we really went to the women rather than getting women to come to us. So that was another part of the strategy. And we decided to have a public hearing only because we wanted to educate the public city officials, like government officials, people who make public policy. You can't get them to a room to have a conversation. They're, they won't care, right? So we wanted three things from them. We wanted them, we want to educate them, like increase their awareness. We wanted them to promise that they were going to do something. And we had three things we wanted from them. And we wanted them to put money. And we wanted them to publicly state where we could videotape them committing, right? Public hearing is the only place because when you have a public hearing in the city in, a, in the United States, they automatically um, video it, right? So they film it because it goes on the public television news, right? So we had women testifying and men testifying. We had three demands. We wanted them to adopt CEDAW, uh, have a gender analysis in allocation service delivery, allocation of funds, service delivery and employment, right? Every city demand. And we wanted 200,000 <laughs> with staff, right? And we wanted them to say it like to the camera, right? So we said it in the, at the beginning, we said it in the middle, so the public hearing went through and we gave them the mic. So everyone had to got the mic to their hand. We passed it through to say something about what they had witnessed. And we had given them a cheat sheet about what we wanted them to say. So nobody, no government official wants to tell that they're a human rights violator. Nobody wants to say, oh, I don't agree to human rights of women. Some have. You know, we, we've had a precedent, right? But, but in general, nobody would do that. So we got that. 
we had it on film. The following day, we, we were ready to pass legislation. We had a draft legislation we had been working on. We took it to the mayor. We told what was good, where we wanted it, and how good it would be for the country if he did, you know, if he passed CEDAW. He'll look good, right, in the, in, in the rest of the country. So it's strategies and leadership is really about knowing when to step in and step out, right, and step away, right? So although there were three of us who did all the work, right? We knew that there were times that we had to step back and just be seated and somebody else had to tell the people what, they, what we wanted, right? You have to put in front of, so if you want to change somebody's thinking, you have to figure out who they will listen to and put that person, right, in front to tell them what you want. So it's knowing really to step back, right? That is how CEDA was passed. So the implementation was we got $200,000. We got a staff person. We got the gender analysis was done in Department of Public Works. That's who decides where street lights go, right? It's a non-traditional space. And we did a gender analysis in a dip, um, juvenile probation department because we wanted to see what will happen in a direct service space if you pass CEDA right and engaging it and a place where nobody knows you know anything when they put street lights on the road like nobody cares whether it's women men dogs whatever right um and it that's and we had a task force to monitor it that was made up of government and non-governmental people that's that's the story Indeed, uh, human rights are so interconnected that it should be applied at all levels. And connected to that question, we all know that implementation and making sure that it is followed by the citizens is another thing. So with that, what are the initiatives that are being done to ensure that this legislation is followed by the city and its citizens? I'm sorry, was there a question in that? Did I miss it? Um, I was no. asking um, what are the initiatives that are being done to ensure that this legislation is followed by the city and its citizens, considering that in society, we have the tendency to, um, some people or majority of people think that there is still a patriarchal and misogynistic mindset, or at least here in the Philippines, that's the case. So um, there may be legislations, but it's not really followed because of these mindsets. But in San Francisco, what are the initiatives that are being done to ensure that it is followed by the city and the citizens itself? So remember at an early stage, I said that you have to really figure out what the purpose is. Like, what do you really want at the end? CEDAW is not what we really wanted, right? CEDA is the means, right? What we really wanted was that every woman in San Francisco, whether she was a citizen or not, whether she was gay or straight or disabled or able-bodied, regardless of who she was, she was able to thrive. Right? And that is a tall order, right? To want everyone to thrive. We, it wasn't good enough for us to say like, oh, she has to be safe. She has to be beyond that, right? She has to be a contributing person. She has to have joy, right? And we felt that CEDAW was one way to get there. So because of that, it was, we recognized that passing CEDAW was only the first step. While we were passing CEDAW, we were getting ready for the next five years, right? So there were a couple of things we put in place and we continue, I mean, I think the city is continuing to put in place, but there were certain things, you know, when you're an NGO, when you're an activist, once a piece of legislation is passed, you have like no authority on it, right? You can scream from the outside, but you're not the implementer, 
right? So then that means that you have to make sure those who make decisions in the city, right? And those who are implementing it, implementing public policy are closely aligned with you. Otherwise the timing is wrong, okay? So you could see some cities have passed CEDA, but no implementation is happening, right? So we wanted to make sure that San Francisco had a very strong department on the status of women, right? So there was a commission, the commission became a department. That means that they had more money, more power, they could make decisions for themselves. So CEDA legislation put that in place, right? We said that the, so we also had a human rights commission in San Francisco and we were very worried the mayor who really loved the director of the human rights commission would want it there, right? So we made a case and we made sure that in the legislation, it said that the commission on the status of women is the implementing body, right? So that is one, you have to anchor who is going to control and, and operationalize it, right? And there could, you know, things can go wrong, but there are at least certain things you have to put in place. You have to put into the pipeline women who are going to be in leadership within the city. When it got passed, San Francisco have majority women city council members. And the men we had were actually even more progressive than the women. Right, But we decided to go with the woman who was middle of the road and we wanted her to carry the legislation because if she carried it, she couldn't fight it. Right? She couldn't fight against it. She was a businesswoman. We knew that she wasn't going to like the idea. Right, So I spent two hours with her kind of looking at what she liked and how CEDAW would make what she liked better for women like bank accounts, like jobs, radio shows, right? And how, so, and we wanted her to carry the legislation because if she carried it, no, you know, everyone else would, would have no problem, right? But she would have been our problem. So we wanted her to carry it, right? Uh, and we put more women into the system to be appointed, to be elected, into office. We had a whole list of women. As soon as CEDA was passed, we told the city that they needed to be appointed to the most powerful commissions within the first six months, right? And from the and we had an amazing director that we made sure we lobbied for at the Department on the Status of Women, Emily Morase, you would see her name, right? That wasn't easy because the mayor always wanted someone else, right? So there was a lot of work we continually did. So it's a parallel process, right? When she came on, that wasn't good enough. We had to make sure there was money, right? So then we got that the current governor then was a council member. Uh, we went to him, he passed a piece of legislation when there was a budget cut to say that the budget has to be looked from a gendered standpoint. Right? I don't think he even read it. He's like, ah, sure, sure, right? <laughs> it was a cool thing and he was a very radical out there person. And he saw things very differently than the traditional politician. Right? He, and he took risks, right? So, so it's baby steps, but you have to take those steps like every year, right? So you have to run a parallel process. And there are times in San Francisco, things have gone down or things have gone back, right? But nevertheless, it moves forward. So I have left San Francisco, so I haven't been there for seven years, but the work is continuing. And all of us who, there were, there were three of us who helped push it through. Patty Chang, who was the uh, executive director, the president of the Women's Foundation of California, Dr. Cosette Thompson, who was the head of Amnesty International and myself and a team of young women, right? And we are all gone, but the work is happening because the first 10 years we put things in place, right? So we knew that it was a 10 year journey and we committed the three of us that we were going to work no matter what. Right, so that is kind of how we balanced it.
Thank you so much. I have two more questions. Uh, one is where or how do you get your support to ensure that resources are enough? Are there international, national, and local support? Um, and the other question is, uh, if, are there ways or tools to measure the impact of Cities for SIDA campaign or other women's rights initiatives? Maybe the second one should be answered by Sun Yung, right? <laughs> so for the first one, are you asking about resources for the city for passing and implementing CEDAW or for the organization? The first one. The first one, okay. So it is a hard one, right? So um, technically, when you are implementing policy in a city, right, it has to be part of the city budget, right? So the city budget allocates a certain amount of money for the department uh, on the status of women. You know, some department gets get very creative in how they are going to use tax dollars that the city gets, right, to continue their work. So for the Department on the Status of Women, uh, this doesn't have anything to do with CEDA, but kind of um, runs parallel. They lobbied way before CEDA, the, the commissioners, to make sure that the uh, marriage license money came to the Department on the Status of Women so that gender-based violence programs would be supported because they looked at the statistics of intimate partner violence, right? And said like, okay, the marriage license money needs to come here. So that way there's a there's an ongoing amount of money even when there's a deficit, right? So for example, for the Arts Commission, the tourism money, like a percentage of the hotel tax money in San Francisco goes to the arts. So we have a very nice slush fund for the arts because I used to be on the arts commission, right? Um, so, so to pass and implement, it's really important to have government dollars. However, there is more work to be done. Like if you're running trainings, you have to give food to the people who come for the trainings, right? If you want to inform people about how to even integrate CEDAW into your proposal writing, your evaluations, all of that require money that the gov you can't use the government money for, right? So there's something called Friends of the Department on the Status of Women that got started. And usually every department has this group of friends. That means they are like the fundraising arm, right? That allows you to have a have cash that you could use for these other, um, like for travel, to go speak, to bring a speaker, right? All the things that goes into implementing pu public policy, nobody gives money, right? So that money, right, goes into doing that work. Um, the Department on the Status of Women from time to time does supply for other funds, but in order to implement CEDAW, no money has come in separately unless it's from the Friends, the Commission on the Status of Women, the Friends group that has an annual fundraiser, right? And then there is like this uh, for domestic violence, there's money coming in, right? And then there's like implementable money that goes in. Now, after I've said that, I can say that it also depends uh, if you can be very smart about bridging other, other departments in, right? To solve a problem, then everyone puts in money for that particular reason. So our current vice president in the United States, Kamala Harris, when she was, um, this um, in the, the um, in San Francisco, right? Um, she was elected to office, and she uh, put a task force together called Courage, right? 
And in that, it was really to synchronize all the services to address domestic violence very rapidly, right? So it was, it was done under CEDAW, right? Justice and courage, right? So, so they use CEDAW to really say that all departments must come together to protect women's human rights. And very specifically, the act was to address intimate partner violence. After that work was done, San Francisco went for like 17 months without a femicide because we responded. So there are ways in which you could think about doing work where money alone doesn't solve the problem, right? So a lot of collaborative work actually helps not only in government, also actually in, in our own work as NGOs. So I think that other question is for really Sonia. Um, this is your show, Krishanti. I, I decline to answer, but you answer anything you like. Question in the chat there. Uh, Lillian had, I don't know if Lillian wants to say something. Yeah, um, actually it is very connected for our last question. So we are aware that from end to end, the U.S. has an array of different culture and diverse people from different backgrounds from different cities. So despite these differences, merging from Lillian's question as well, what are other recommendations or suggestions can you give to other cities that you think can help to further improve the promotion of women's rights and CEDAW in general and in their cities as well. You are muted, Kushanti. Okay. So, okay, so you're, Lillian, you're talking about like changing the city, right? Because I just wanted to know when like, I don't know, when you kind of realized that it was making a difference and when you realized that it was, I don't know, something that should be implemented in other cities, um, when, it, when you realized it was working. Um, we realized, um, actually when we started doing the gender analysis that we were onto something because the gender analysis was not where somebody went into a department and checked boxes and monitored them and you know looked at like the way typically human rights reports happen right you you look at violations right um, the gender analysis was a set of questions we gave the department to answer. And it was a very conscious decision. Partly because the Commission on the Status of Women said like, oh my God, they will hate us. We can't do this, <laughs> right? Because if, if one department goes to check on another department and it's the women's department already, like they thought like people are going to, all the other departments would hate them. So they flat out said, you can't do this, right? However, we will help you do it, right? So then we thought that if each department engage in answering questions, they might not answer them accurately. However, having to answer that question would get them to start thinking about how they were running their departments, right? So it was very much of an indirect approach. Right, um, and we fortunately succeeded in that. So lots of the so we the the system was set up like in uh, like the way the international um, uh, CEDAW committee operates. The CEDAW committee has governments coming and reporting, right? And then there's a shadow report. They are asked questions. You know, the government provides their report. The CEDAW committee reads that they have a better understanding of what else is happening, then they would ask questions and give recommendations. That is the model we used. So the departments operated really as countries, right? Because they did not know how to do human rights reports 
and a you know for seed or we develop the gender analysis so it'll make it easy on them. We want I, we did not want to give them the opportunity to ever say this is too hard and we can't do it, right? So we learned that um, gender analysis was working, and because when they came to report. They were like so excited, like it was like they had discovered gender, right? Uh, our former mayor, um, he passed on, Ed Lee. You know, I remember having a conversation. He was the head of administration for the city at that time. He said, Krishanti, can you just tell me how this works? And that is when he was an administrator. I said, yeah, yeah, it's about where street lights go. Like, and so I explained how it's gendered, right? Because street lights are placed by men, right? And there is no legal requirement as to the distance. They place them. Women are inherently more scared of the dark, although majority of the violence they face would come from perpetrators that they know, right? So when we said, ask women where the light should go, right bring us in right uh he just thought he had discovered this idea right so we saw and that was our second year right but the san francisco process was a very well thought out process and i i always say timing is everything the timing was good the right people were in the room inside and out right um and there was a need right and we worked for 18 months before building the ground right so other cities have passed and some cities are doing brilliantly right it wasn't easy for us to really go ahead and start doing it elsewhere because uh, funders really didn't feel that they were ready to accept it right so los angeles actually started working immediately as soon as san francisco passed it but they didn't have the right mayor at that time when the right mayor came in they passed it right so it, it, it's a timing so the leadership really matters right it's not whether it's good it's a good or bad thing and of course every city should pass it because there's a lot that women and men and trans persons will benefit with, right? But the timing has to be right. So Krishanti, I will stop you because it is past our time. But Leslie, do you want to repeat your question? Because I think Krishanti was focused on Lillian and then we'll have to close. Um, I think it's very, um, it's very related to what Lillian asks. Um, the question was, are there any recommendations or suggestions she can give to the other cities that she thinks she can help to further improve the promotion of women's rights and said how in their respective cities? Okay, that might be another session. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in the chat. Yeah, yeah. So I think very shortly, I would say like city should, like there are five things that we could collectively do, not just me, right? I think human rights, understanding of human rights is critical for CEDAW because most who are trying to pass CEDAW is trying to pass CEDAW, right? But not really understanding that it is a step towards realizing women's human rights, right? So that's, that's, that's an important piece that we, we can collectively help on, right? Second is strategy, right? It is really important to know your 18 month cycle in your city or your county, right? So that is something again that we can do, right? Third is about who is on the ground, right? And a lot of stuff is around um, who, are, who are your allies? Who, who are you comfortable working with, right? And who are you not comfortable working with? Right, I think that is important. Um, and the, 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 the fourth one is like, do you have, and, and most of this you, you can, like we, it doesn't require a Krishanti or a Sunyam, right? It requires people to really recognize 
the, once you build that stuff, you have to really ask the question, to what end are we doing this work? And will it bring about the change that we want for women? Will it improve the quality of life of women, right? Those questions need to be answered. And the fifth and final is really about who is in power at that time, right? So we are able to, and, and I think there are different people in the Cities for CEDAW space who can help with these things at different times. And collectively, I think we have an amazing body of knowledge and a bulldozing of courage that can propel the work. Thank you so much, Trishanti. Thank you for your amazing explanation of everything. Um, just we wanted to, to say that undeniably all this wisdom, learnings and information will create an impact on other aspiring leaders and truly empower all of us here. Um, this interview motivated all of us to not to stop in promoting our advocacy in whatever way we can. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day. I agree. I agree with Natalia as well. So on behalf of our team on their Cities for Sidao, we are taking this opportunity to express our very heartfelt gratitude to you, Nitz Krishanti, for sharing your time and learning with us. We sincerely hope that we get to work with you or serve with you in promotion of Sidao globally. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for doing this work. Thank you for giving your intellect and your heart. <laughs>